Welcome back. This is the third lecture for the Advanced Pollinator Training Module for the Hawaii Master Gardeners on bee reproduction and life cycles. If you're just joining us and intend to complete the advanced certification, please be sure to take the pretest before continuing, which is located on the course homepage. If you haven't done so already, be sure to complete quizzes one and two. By the end of this module, you will have a detailed understanding of the honeybee life cycle, understand the division of labor in honeybees, be able to compare and contrast the life cycles of honeybees with solitary bees, and know the basic nutritional requirements for bee development. In entomology, metamorphosis is the term we use to describe insect development from egg to adult, and there are two means by which this can occur. In the most evolutionary basal, or the oldest insect groups, we see a hemimetabolous developmental pathway. This means that the adult female lays eggs, which then hatch into a mini version of the adult. As the insect ages, it molts to shed the exoskeleton and allow growth. Each of these stages are referred to as an instar, and depending on the insect, there may be different numbers of instars. In this example on the left, the locust has five instars before undergoing a final molt to become an adult. In mayflies, there can be upwards of 20 molts before they become adults. These immature stages can be told apart from the adults because their wings are not yet fully developed. Only adults are capable of flying. The other developmental pathway that we see in the newer or more evolutionary derived insect groups is holometabolism, which is probably the type you're most familiar with. The adult female lays eggs, which hatch into a larva that also undergoes growth through instars, usually five, before pupating and undergoing an extreme reorganization of their internal and external organs, and finally emerging as an adult. If you had to take a guess, which type of metamorphosis do you think bees undergo? If you guessed holometabolous metamorphosis, then you're correct. Just like butterflies, a female lays an egg, which hatches into a larva that grows, undergoes pupation, and finally emerges as an adult bee. Let's start by examining this in solitary bees. As mentioned in the first lecture, we have 19 species of introduced bees in Hawaii, in addition to the approximately 70 species of native Hylaeus. With the exception of honeybees, all of the remaining bees in Hawaii have solitary lifestyles. This means that as opposed to living in a colony and working as a group, individual females are responsible for reproducing, locating a nest, and provisioning her young. Let's examine this in more detail using the leafcutter bee, Megachile timberlaki, which was introduced to Hawaii from the Pacific Islands and is currently established on Hawaii, Kauai, Lanai, Maui, and Oahu Islands. In their natural habitat, females seek out hollow stems as a nest for their young. They can also take advantage of discarded dry bamboo and holes drilled into old wood as nesting habitat. In the leaf cutter bees, the female cuts out perfect circles from leaves and uses these to make leaf cells inside of her chosen nest. Then, using specialized hairs on the underside of her abdomen, she collects and stores pollen inside of that cell and finally lays an egg. Then she starts all over again until the nest has been filled with developing young. She will plug the opening to her nest with some additional leaf material which is how we know that it is an active nest with developing brood inside. In these solitary bees, there is little obvious difference between the males and females. Females will have a stinger, though they are unlikely to use it against people, which is a modified ovipositor or structure used to lay eggs, whereas the males do not and will have a more rounded abdomen. Males also have 13 segments on their antennae while well, females only have 12, in case you care to get a very close look. 
Now in humans, whether an offspring is male or female isn't the choice of the mother. It's determined by chance. We have what is referred to as the XY sex determination system. When a mommy loves a daddy and their genes combine, the resultant embryo has a 50% chance of being a daughter or a son. This is because all females have two X chromosomes and males have one X and one Y chromosome. All offspring inherit an X from their mom and either an X or a Y from their dad. If you got an X from your dad, then you're a female. And if you got a Y from your dad, then you're a male. Thus, all offspring are 50% related to each parent and 50% related to their siblings. Now, because being a mother isn't stressful enough, unlike humans, bees have the additional burden of having to choose whether or not an egg they lay will develop into a male or female offspring, something which is biologically unique to bees, wasps, and ants. This is a sex determination system referred to as haplodiploidy. Female hymenopterans, or all bees, wasps, and ants, have an organ referred to as a spermatheca, pictured at the top left in pink. On her mating flight, the female mates with multiple males and stores their sperm in this organ. Later, when she lays her eggs, they will move from the ovary to the vagina where fertilization may or may not occur. The lower image shows two spermatheca from honeybees on the tip of someone's finger, the one on the right with stored sperm that the female will use the remainder of her life. Gender in bees is not determined by which chromosome is received from the mother and father, but rather if any genetic material is received from the father at all. When a female fertilizes an egg, that egg develops into a female. When she doesn't fertilize that egg, it develops into a male. This means that a son receives 100% of his genes from his mother, which represents 50% of her total genes, and thus has no father. A daughter, on the other hand, still receives 50% of her genes from her mother and father, and thus has twice as many of genes as her brothers. Unlike in humans, relatedness between siblings is also different. Brothers share 50% of their genes with their sisters, since all of the brothers' genes came from the mother, though it represents only 50% of the genes the mother had to give. Sisters, on the other hand, are only 25% related to their brothers, though they are 75% related to each other. For the purposes of this class, you will not be expected to calculate the math behind this but take a moment to review the colors in the pie charts above to help wrap your head around why this breaks down the way it does. So why would they do this? Why would they adopt such a complicated sex determination system requiring pie charts with so many colored triangles? What prompted solitary bee females to shake the patriarchy and decide for themselves whether to lay daughter or son eggs? Well, it's not exactly a conscious decision. It is informed by different biological cues. Generally, male offspring take less time to develop than their sisters in solitary bees, and a nest only has one way in and out. If you have to step on everyone else to get out, it makes sense to put your daughters deep in the nest since they'll take longer and put your sons towards the entrance. The deeper the nesting cavity, the more female eggs that will be laid in that nest. So this is a good reason to be able to control the sex of your offspring. Another reason is nest parasitism. There are a number of nest parasites, including wasps, other species of bees, and flies, whose larvae may consume the bee's egg or larvae, or consume all of the pollen, causing the baby bee to starve. Sounds mean, but it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there, and the solitary bees do have a defense. The faster you can provision your nest, the less amount of time that parasites have to get in there. 
In the graph on the left, if it took a female leaf cutter bee 24 hours to collect the leaves and pollen for a single cell, the risk of that cell being parasitized was around 50%. The parasites in this case are a pollinating fly, anthrax anthrax, that flicks her eggs inside the nest tunnel, and a type of fruit fly, Cacazinus indigator. This puts larger bee females who can collect more during each foraging trip and provision their nests more quickly at an advantage. The graph on the right shows that deeper cells have a low likelihood of parasitism in general. So put the longer to provision daughters there and males towards the entrance where parasitism risks are higher, but you can provision and close the cells more quickly to help reduce the impact. Haplodiploidy also makes biological sense in honeybees, albeit for different reasons. Unlike solitary bees, honeybees are eusocial, meaning that the only female that lays eggs in the colony is the queen. The queen is the largest member in the colony with an elongated abdomen to accommodate all the tens of thousands of eggs she will lay in her lifetime. Because sisters are 75% related to each other, but would only be 50% related to their offspring, it makes sense to devote their energy to raising their sisters rather than their own young. And because they're only 25% related to their brothers, who are also referred to as drones, they'll only tolerate their presence for a short time since all they do inside is eat. Unlike solitary bees, honeybees construct comb inside a protected hive. All the brood undergo their life cycle inside a single honeycomb cell until they emerge as an adult, and the workers cap the developing pupa with wax to metamorphose in peace. While the queen ultimately decides whether to not fertilize an egg and lay a drone, the workers can help her decide by constructing drone cells, which are slightly larger than the standard worker cells. Workers have a shorter tapered abdomen, while drones are slightly larger with a rounded abdomen and very large eyes, all the better to spot potential mates with. Just like the queen, their sole purpose is reproduction, but unlike the queen, they die after mating. Queens will mate with up to 20 males on her nuptial flights over a period of about four days, after which she will live out the remainder of her life laying eggs using the sperm stored in her spermatheca. This is a figure of the standard life cycle of the whole colony in a temperate region. At the end of the winter, the queen starts laying eggs to boost the number of workers available to start foraging first thing in the spring. As the number of workers rapidly increases, they outgrow the hive and undergo swarming, where the queen will leave with a contingent of workers to form a new colony. Those left behind will create a new queen to take over. Emergence and egg laying continue through the summer but the queen stops laying eggs in the fall as they all start to prepare for winter. Bees that emerge in the fall are biologically programmed to survive all winter, and they'll form a cluster inside the hive to stay warm and eat their honey stores. Then the cycle starts all over again the following spring. In Hawaii, where we don't have true winter, egg production does occur year round but evidence suggests it slows during the winter. This makes sense as our honeybee species, Apis mellifera, is native to Europe and may possess an internal clock telling them it's winter, even though the palms are still swaying. Developmental rates of the sexes differ in honeybees. While they are all an egg for the same amount of time, about three days, Queens develop the quickest, with only five days between hatching and pupation, compared to six days for workers and seven days for drones. They also have the shortest pupation duration of only eight days. 
Now, the queen is the largest individual in the colony, and based on what we know for solitary bees, that would imply she should take the longest to develop. However, colonies will rear multiple queens simultaneously, and once they emerge, they will kill any other unemerged queens and battle any emerged queens to the death. There can only be one queen bee, which is why healthy colonies produce queens in the spring during swarming. Therefore, it is essential that queens develop and emerge as soon as possible. Once they've taken out the competition, the queen will leave the hive to go on nuptial flights, or she will locate a drone swarm and mate while flying. Once she returns to the colony, after numerous such flights, she will commence egg laying. When the queen ages, her ability to produce pheromones that keep her attendees loyal begins to decline. She may run out of sperm and only be able to lay unfertilized drone eggs or stop laying altogether. This is referred to as queen failure and the workers will then work to replace her. The drones take the longest to develop and emerge, over three weeks. Once they emerge as an adult, they congregate near the brood in the colony and rely upon their sisters to feed them via trophallaxis, which is when the sisters regurgitate food for them. It's not gross when bees do it, which is why we give it a fancy name. As they age over the next week and a half, they rely less on their sisters and are able to feed themselves. This is an important period because although they are adults, their flight muscles and sexual organs are still maturing. Once they reach full developmental maturity, they will leave the colony to go on mating flights, one to four each afternoon weather permitting between three and 5 p.m., with each lasting about a half hour. During these flights, the drones fly to drone congregation areas where they congregate as a large swarm with males from other colonies and mate with virgin queens when they arrive. He returns to the colony if unsuccessful because if he is successful, the act of mating causes his penis to separate from his body and he bleeds to death. If any drones are still present in the colony as it prepares to overwinter, the workers will evict them and they will die of starvation, exposure, or predation. The worker bees, which make up the vast majority of individuals in a colony, are the most interesting contributors to colony life. Like their brothers, they're not fully developed even after they emerge as an adult. As they age and different organs or processes activate or cease, they are responsible for performing different tasks to keep the colony running. There are a lot of tasks to be performed and not every individual will do them all, but this is the general breakdown of when they start after adult emergence. Initially, as their exoskeletons harden, newly emerged bees solicit food from their sisters and groom themselves for a couple days. They then transition to cleaning out old cells as they age, their mandibular and hypopharyngeal glands in their heads develop, which allows them to create protein-rich food for larvae. At first, they feed honey and bee bread to the older larvae, then transition to tending younger larvae. The hypopharyngeal glands are only active for a few days before atrophying, and the workers then transition to tending the queen. As they enter their middle years, workers transition to general hive maintenance tasks. They will greet foragers and take their nectar and pollen loads and store them appropriately in the comb. They'll also take on the task of clearing out debris. At this point, another organ has developed, the wax glands. These are located on the underside of their abdomens and for a period of only a few days, these glands secrete wax, which is used in comb production. This is an energetically expensive task as it takes an estimated eight pounds of honey to produce only one pound of wax. And that's why beekeepers will provide their bees with wax foundation to limit new wax production 
and conserve honey for harvest. Around the same time, the alarm pheromones also start to develop and bees transition to guarding the entrance of the colony. The final task they perform is foraging. One of the factors thought to contribute to foraging is that the entire time the bee has been inside the colony, they haven't pooped, and the urge may be enough to prompt initial scouting flights. Now this transition is not concrete, and many factors in the environment or within the colony itself may override a natural timeline of progression. For example, if something happens and all the foragers suddenly die, this will trigger precocious foraging in nurse bees who will forego other tasks and go straight to foraging to ensure there are ample pollen and nectar flows to support the next generation. From an outward appearance, foraging would seem to be the most important task. Nectar is collected and returned to the colony where it is dehydrated and amended with enzymes before being converted to honey to feed the colony through winter. Pollen is collected and is the primary source of protein for the bees. Let's go back to our example of leafcutter bees. The female has hairs on her abdomen that she uses to collect pollen for her brood. She is also sipping nectar when she forages. When she returns to her nest, she mixes a little of that nectar with the raw pollen to hold it together and balance protein and carbohydrates for the developing larvae. The diet is always the same, regardless of whether she lays a male or female egg. Not so in honeybees. I've discussed what goes into making a female or a male, but what determines whether that female becomes a queen or a worker? Remarkably, it is not genetics, but the diet they are fed. This means the workers are who control whether an egg is destined to be a queen or another worker. The development and function of hypopharyngeal and mandibular glands that cue when a worker bee takes over larval feeding is the critical component of this. The protein-rich substance produced in these glands is sort of akin to breast milk. Eggs that are destined to be workers are fed a substance called worker jelly, produced by hypopharyngeal and mandibular glands of the nurse bees for the first two days of development. After that, they are transitioned to a diet composed mostly of bee bread and honey with some additional secretions. Bee bread is produced by mixing raw pollen with enzymes and a little honey and allowed to age before being fed to larvae. Queens are fed a similar substance initially, known as royal jelly, also secreted by the nurses, though this is lower in fats than worker jelly. She is fed royal jelly until she pupates and thus is also denied the protein from bee bread fed to her plebeian sisters. The workers expand her beeswax cell to accommodate the larger size of a queen as she grows. This concludes the third advanced pollinator training module. For those of you pursuing the advanced certification for the Hawaii Master Gardeners, don't forget to take quiz three found under lesson materials. You need a score of 70% or greater for credit. Stay tuned for the next lecture, which will be given by Dr. Paul Krushnicki of UH Manoa on Hawaii's native yellow-faced bees.